Hello, everybody. I'm Seth Kosullivan, co-founder and CEO of NS Nanotech. I hope everybody out there is staying safe and well around the world. I'm talking to you from my home office here in Los Angeles, California, USA, and I'm glad everybody can join us virtually for this talk. Thanks for tuning in to NS Nanotech's talk on submicron LED pixels for micro LEDs. Our paper describes some amazing new results that we have achieved in a very short period of time. And for me, this is also a chance to tell you a bit about the innovations that led to the company and myself to this point. I'm very grateful to my fellow committee members for allowing me this opportunity to tell you all about it. Now, no doubt many of you know me still as the quantum doc guy from my work at QD Vision several years ago. After that, I helped Luminant launch a holographic smart component that we sold to North and which was recently acquired by Google. But at about the same time, I learned about Professor Zeti and me and his research group, which had started at McGill and then had moved to the University of Michigan. Professor Mee had created, over the course of a decade, a series of inventions in which I saw the potential to completely redefine what an LED is. Most approaches start with LEDs and then make them mini and eventually micro, all the while fighting the challenges of materials physics. But Professor Mee was making true nano LEDs from the bottoms up, something that really appealed to me with my QD background. These innovations, like many others, had the potential to disrupt our industry, and so today I'm excited to share with you not just how these innovations stack together, but also results showing you some of the world's firsts and world's records, which really demonstrate conclusively just how big a breakthrough this is. To do that, I'll start with describing to you the material science innovations that the Mee Group has made over a decade plus, and how that gives potential to solve some major problems in the LED and display industries. Then I'll show you some results to convince you that this is indeed real. And finally, I'll share a few slides on the company and how you in the audience can contribute to bringing this innovation to have a real market impact. As many of you know, this is my true measure of success, and I know as well as anyone in this industry, true impact won't come from one person or one company, but rather this whole industry collaborating to put amazing products into people's living rooms. NS Nanotech's technology platform can solve the green gap enable mini-LED displays, micro-LED main displays, and micro-displays, and beyond that, too, extending to UVC LEDs, far UVC LEDs, and even carbon capture and water splitting using similar structures. Like other major breakthroughs in material science, the technology doesn't come from a single invention. Rather, it is built on a series of foundational pillars, followed by a series of innovations that we're combining together. The three foundational pillars are 50 years of knowledge in MBE, molecular beam epitaxy, nitride semiconductors, where recent Nobel Prizes have been granted, and nanostructures themselves, where myself and many others have explored all the amazing properties that can result if we make things smaller and from the bottoms up. Professor Mee's group has innovated upon that foundation. Among other things, they have invented catalyst-free nanocolumn growth, disk and nanocolumn architecture, true photonic bandgap LEDs and lasers, and finally, monolithic RGB integration in a single process step. Let me tell you about each of these innovations in turn. Having nano columns in our LED might have some benefits, but growing the materials colloidally, as I used to do, leads to all sorts of problems when trying to do electroluminescence. Growing them anchored to a surface makes EL much easier, but most techniques use a metal catalyst for each column that leads to purity problems and again makes EL quite challenging. A decade ago, the Mee Group pioneered a method of growing high-purity nitride semiconductor material, referenced here below, from almost any surface and with full doping control that allowed for facile creation of LEDs. This technique allowed for gallium nitride, but also PNN doping as the column grew, and of course alloying with either indium for visible or aluminum for UV emission. And he could do this because of the nano aspect, without thick buffer layers that add time in the chamber and hence cost to the production of planar LED materials. Finally, you can see that this technique enables selective area growth, or selective area epitaxy, to really take off and thrive. The positional placement, accuracy, but also flexibility, packing density, etc., is truly phenomenal, and you'll see how that in turn will enable one of the other major innovations I'm highlighting here.
Nano columns make for pretty pictures, and we've now made them relatively easy to grow, but they actually harm you when it comes to surface area. And as you know, surface area in a semiconductor device is a near fatal flaw. It leads to crystallinity defects, surface trap states, and ultimately non-radiative emission pathways that kill efficiency. The invention of disk in a nano column, sometimes called dot in a wire, nanostructures, are a great way to solve this problem on paper, but complex to implement. Growing core shell nanocrystals in solution from the inside out makes sense from a chemistry process flow, but growing sheaths on the outside of a column in a process that is meant to be a bottom-to-top, layer-by-layer growth, epitaxy, well, that's hard. What the Me group came up with is a way to utilize the natural differences in atomic migration along the crystal surfaces, something you literally can't prevent, and to leverage this to create aluminum-rich regions, indium-poor regions, etc., in the crystal while you're growing it from the bottom to the top, and to do this without needing to come back with a process step later. What you end up with is that at the same time that you're growing these atomically precise quantum wells, the higher bandgap material is flowing to the outside of each column, protecting the quantum wells from the surface states, or forming a nanocrystal shell, if you will. The result is material IQEs that are simply unheard of, most especially in the green and red regions of the spectrum. It is the MBE that lets you lock in these high indium content quantum wells away from thermal equilibrium, and the disk in a column approach that lets them emit at high efficiency, unlike conventional nanowire approaches or planar approaches. And of course, the index of our material is not that of gallium nitride, but is lowered somewhat by the effective index approximation to make outcoupling easier in these materials than in planar bulk materials. So now we've got these very efficient nanocolumns of indium gallium nitride emissive material that I can place almost arbitrarily, and you wonder how we can make them even better. That is where a photonic crystal can come in. All conventional LEDs emit from their semiconductor band gap, which is basically determined by the amount of indium in the indium gallium nitride quantum wells, but also has a strong dependence on temperature. But emission from the semiconductor band gap leads to instability problems when this indium ratio isn't perfectly controlled or when the device heats up. Hence, we bin every LED ever made for color, which is essentially binning them for indium content. And then we have to worry about color shifts with temperature, especially when we're making a display, most especially when we're making a display that might want to operate at more than one current level, say a mini LED backlight or a micro LED display. So we leverage the fact that our columns are smaller than the wavelength of light, and that we can place them with 2D lithography sub-nanometer accuracy. We design the columns into a periodic lattice, a photonic crystal, with a pitch of roughly a fraction of the wavelength of light that you're trying to produce. And now we also have a photonic band gap that overlays the semiconductor band gap. So when we run current through our nano column, we create electron hole pairs across the semiconductor band gap that are ready for spontaneous emission. But if they're resident with the photonic cavity we've created, they emit far faster, beating out the non-radiative pathways but also all in exactly the same frequency, regardless of the actual semiconductor band gap, so long as there is some overlap between the two. Oh, and by the way, the photons leaping out of this cavity all leap out in exactly the same way, and so we end up with very directional light, too, out of the vertical surface without any wave guiding or light being trapped due to the high index of gallium nitride. This is great for all LEDs, but an outsized benefit if you're trying to make a sign or a display where we can't use reflective cups around each LED to get the high efficiencies that are reported for typical LED packages. So now you've got a saturated color, directional emitted em emitter that you don't need to bend. Finally, we have to deal with how to integrate this material onto a substrate and what constraints we've put on the wafer material. Again, we've already eliminated the thick buffer since the nano columns grow without defect on almost anything. So in many ways, we don't care about the substrate. Sapphire is convenient, but silicon is even easier. And we can even talk about growing this onto a metal surface or foil. So that's nice for cost, and perhaps for 12-inch silicon integration. But we can also place these nano columns arbitrarily in X, Y, and control their shape and size. So why are they all the same color? First, the team showed that in three successive growths, they could put down red, then green, then blue nano columns in distinct steps by varying the indium flux. But then they realized that by further understanding the migration of atoms as they deposit, they could actually use diameter to control color. 
wide columns incorporate less indium into their discs. They have a smaller band gap energy than do narrow columns. Interesting. So now we've shown that we can make RGB subpixels on the same substrate at the same time in a single growth step just by setting up the diameters just right in the catalyst free growth step. They've used this to make white pixels up to four colors on a single step and even to turn on single wire devices that are different colors and adjacent to each other within a single square micron of area. Amazing. By now you've realized that I'm not talking about nanowire LEDs. I'm talking about catalyst-free, disc in a column, monolithically integrated photonic band gap LEDs. We tried doing what we always do and use the acronym. It's CFDIC MIPBG LEDs, but it didn't work. So we've decided to just call them nano LEDs. And what can we do with this new class of product we're calling nano LEDs? Now that I've laid out for you Professor Mee's material science innovations, let me talk about how they come together to, to deliver the next generation of performance of LEDs and ultimately displays. Nano LEDs are going to have best in class line width measured in full width half max for best in class color saturation. We are talking about laser quality light without the coherence and speckle problem. We're talking about Rec 2020 period without the percentage modifier to worry about. Nano LEDs are going to have best in class color stability. The color doesn't change with temperature. It doesn't change with current. It doesn't change with doping levels. It doesn't need to be binned. Nano LEDs are stable, same material, same current densities, easier heat extraction, unpackaged LEDs that survive for years and still operate identically. Data will prove it, but this is not an OLED, a QD, or God forbid an electroluminescent QLED, let me assure you. Nano LEDs are going to have best in class size. We can and have made 200 nanometer devices that have the same performance as millimeter devices. For the photonic band gap, we need a few repeat units, so let's say a micron and up. So now you get to choose the LED size for brightness and cost, not for efficiency reasons. And of course, nano LEDs are going to have best in class efficiency at any size. This is a work in progress, but we're making rapid progress to date because these innovations make it our right. We are just applying decades of good LED engineering to these innovations and seeing the sort of doublings you can expect. So nano LEDs have obvious applicability in the emerging micro LEDs that we're also excited about. Use our material to make a micro display if you've got the backplane tech. Use our material to make a main display if you've got the mass transfer tech. We're focused on making wafers of material for any use, not on the backplanes they will eventually sit on. But along the way, we see lower hanging fruit where we can sell into existing markets. We're going to eliminate the green gap and near term will double green LED efficiency. So let's sell green LEDs into signage and architectural lighting applications. Then we'll have RGB LEDs on a single trip, which will be the solution of choice for the mini LED backlights driving LCD innovation today. We all know the advantages of RGB direct emitters over down conversion, but handling triple the chips with different behaviors due to temperature and with low green efficiency makes this a non-starter today. With an RGB chip made out of InGAN, it will win over phosphor or QD every time. And then finally, micro LEDs is where we end up once all the other challenges in manufacturing, etc., get solved by this community of brilliant engineers. So, some data to back up all these ambitious statements. Efficiency I would describe as in the game now, just a few months into our company's operation. Here I show you a green device with an EQE approaching 6%. It's not 60%, but for a device design that doesn't care if it's 200 microns or 2 microns, this is right in the game, and we're still growing our efficiency exponentially. We see a clear pathway to 50% EQE, 40% wall plug efficiency, doubling what planar devices can achieve today after decades of careful engineering. Some data on emission spectrum and mine the scale. The power of this photonic band gap applied at the level of the individual nano column emitters, not just a thin film coating on top of a planar LED. The power of this photonic band gap is that we are making material with a PL full width half maximum of a couple of nanometers. 
and it broadens out in EL to a whopping 4 nanometer Fuller's half max. Now, the last time I bought a green laser diode and measured it, the Fuller's half max was 4 nanometers. There is a little bit more background emission from that spontaneous emission that it's completing, competing with. But again, this is early days, lots of room for improvement, but we don't want it to get any narrower. And again, when I scan 300 Kelvin in temperature on this emission, the peak shifts about 0.4 nanometers, where for a QD or just about any other semiconductor, it would shift from green to orange. Happy to have someone in the audience point out otherwise, but to me, this is the world record for most saturated LED emission. And finally, directionality. We didn't design this for a particularly narrow cone, and our modeling shows that we can control this to be narrower or wider, since some applications don't really want directionality. But again, I think this is probably a world's best for a narrow cone angle LED. The full width half max is about 10 degrees. So not only is this laser quality in spectrum, but in its divergence too. In fact, a symmetrical 10 degree cone is better than most laser diodes you can find out there. So I think you'll see that by leveraging this amazing positional control and the photonic band gap effect, we really are making a new class of LEDs, quite different from what we're all used to. It's a technology that truly has the potential to disrupt the $20 billion LED market. By now, hopefully I've convinced you that our breakthroughs in material science will lead to performance breakthroughs that will enable real change in our industry. And hopefully I've got you asking yourself, what does this mean to me? Or how can I make sure my company benefits? Or maybe even, how can I help? So first on that list is just getting to know us. We're a very small company, very early stage, and so there are lots of things we can't do ourselves and lots of ways we will benefit from the display community. We see our mission bringing this material technology to the device makers for incorporation into LED products and display products. If you want to buy material and wafers, please reach out. Second, get to know our team. You know many of us already, and I personally know many of you, we make a point of getting to know Professor Zeti and me, the brilliant scientist behind all of this. He's already been invited to SID Korea, IMID, and SID Japan, IDW, so please reach out. Our advisory board is comprised of Dr. Jai Bardwaj, the former CTO of Lumelids here in the U.S., of Dr. Jun Suk, the former CTO of Samsung Display in Korea, and Dr. Jang Lin Chen, who many of you know from Kodak, ITRI, and now AUO. My co-founder is Rick Bolander, is the experienced VC of the group. Joe Lin is on legal and IP, and Surya Ganti is another experienced entrepreneur in display land. We are a small but growing team, so get to know us and keep pushing talented engineers my way that you think would be a good fit as we grow our team. But mostly, we're looking for interested downstream partners that see the impact that this could have on making their products better. We're looking for LED customers who might want to buy LED wafer material and who can help us set the specs for our first product release. Micro-LED players that are looking for better green, red, and RGB material to work with, who can help us understand how to develop a material compatible with their manufacturing processes. Signage and lighting customers who can pull product through into their application spaces. Engineers looking for a great place to work. And of course, investors. We are a development stage company and are planning to raise more capital in 2021. So anyone interested in being part of this mission should of course reach out. So to wrap up, I want to thank you if you actually made it to the end of this virtual talk. Hopefully I've taught you a little bit about nano LEDs, convinced you that they will have a major impact on displays, and shown you that our already record-setting performance will continue to improve until it is the new standard for the LED and display industry. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. I hope to connect with many of you in person as we continue our development work. Please feel free to visit our virtual Display Week booth in the iZone, and if you have any other questions, please email me or give me a call anytime. Thank you so much.